In about 2013, teenage me decided it would be a good idea to try and write a proper story, something decently long with a decent number of chapters without a plot, where nothing happened. So I borrowed this little block of notepaper and started scribbling down whatever came into my head, just any old thing. Over the next few years I would occasionally add a couple of paragraphs here and there, sellotaping each completed page to the emerging concertina scroll. It was a fun project. It made me and my sister laugh. I never finished it, but oh well, it was fun. Now, without anything really happening in the actual story, I was forced to get pretty meta and forth warly, and these elements got so involved that they eventually turned into a plot, the thing I wasn't supposed to have, so I ended up failing at my initial goal, and, well, just listen, it'll make sense eventually, in a way. This being the work of a teenager, there's some bits that are a bit cringe, some bits, especially in chapter 2, that are a bit questionable and that my present self would never have included. But I leave them here as a sort of historical record to preserve as best I can the original experience. So let me introduce to one and all the incredible tale of Francesco Zefkington McMefkington and his dog Douglas, pronounced Arkansas, pronounced Arkansas. Chapter 1 The man opened an envelope. It was white and had a plastic window on the front through which you could see the address. Within this envelope was a letter from the gas company saying that Francesco should have paid his gas bill earlier on. Being a very good-natured person, he cursed the gas company's founder and dropped this letter into a shredder and then burnt the shreddings and fed the ashes to his dog, Douglas. Arkansas. At this point, Arkansas. Douglas doesn't appear again in the story, so please forget about him. This was a very usual day so far, except that this was 2am, and Francesco was only just having lunch. Usually he would have had it at about 1pm, but as this was the birthday of his cat, Douglas, pronounced Srijaya Wardner Puracote, he felt obliged to stay up later than 6 in the evening. Thus begins the story, with a doorbell ringing. This doorbell was in China, but thankfully Francesco lived in not China, so he didn't hear it from the kitchen table. In walked a speck of dust. Oh wait, it didn't. It just blew in from the window. It went in circles and was caught in the beam of light coming from a lamp. Then it came to settle on the floor. Francesco had a budgie. Its name was Douglas, pronounced Douglas. It had feathers and a beak and no food because it had already eaten it all up. Douglas the budgie made a budgie-like sound, as budgies are well known to do. Then, after having flown around a bit in its cage, it sat back down on the perch and laid an egg by mistake. What a beautiful egg, said Francesco, and left it where it was, in China for Douglas the Budgie lived in China. I think I'll go for a walk. But as he was on a tiny yacht in the middle of the Caspian Sea, he could not do that. Oh no, plot paradox detected, said the reader of this book. How did he receive a letter if he is on a boat? Well, my answer to that is that I completely overlooked that detail. You win, the reader of this book. So, here was Francesco, alone with his cat and another animal, which I will not mention for fear of contradicting myself again, sitting at a table in the cabin of his yacht in the middle of the night, eating his lunch. You know, Srijai Warner Puracote the cat, he finally said, I think we are on a boat in the middle of the Caspian Sea. In fact, I distinctly remember sailing here two days ago. I think it was something to do with gas bills or something. <laughs> Don't worry, the gas company have probably completely forgotten about me by now. Let's go home. So up went the sails and across the water went the boat, speeding at a certain speed. After a little while, he arrived at the shore, only to find an annoyed gas man shaking his fist in Francesco's general direction. And so, Francesco rowed back to the middle of the huge lake. On went the TV. This happened because Francesco turned it on. The screen made a sound of white noise, while a flickering picture made up of black and white spots of variable size was projected on the screen by hundreds of pixels. He picked up the remote control and pressed some buttons on it. The picture changed accordingly. This process was repeated a few times, and eventually the TV was off again, for Francesco was bored of it. Out of the cabin he stepped, and the wind lapped at his hair. With a cat and unmentionable animal at either side of his, he stretched out his arms and yawned. Then he proceeded to let down the sails. Up in the sky, thousands of spheroids of gas twinkled charmingly, and the moon was very bright. Semi-visible clouds floated past the black background, occasionally lit up by the tail light of an aeroplane. It was very peaceful. So much so that Sir Douglas Jai the cat yawned too and jumped back into the cabin to sleep, for this is what she loved to do. When the sails were finally down, Francesco got back inside and lay down to sleep and digest his lunch. Chapter 2 Up woke the man, because his alarm clock had gone off mainly, but also because he got bored of staying asleep. He got up and went to make breakfast. Opening a cupboard on the side, he picked up a bowl and a packet of overprocessed seeds with lots of sugar added because the company that made the cereal was running out of ideas. 
He poured the cereal into the bowl and picked up a bottle of milk. Then he poured that, too, into the bowl. Then he dipped his spoon into it and carried right on with his morning. He closed the cupboard and fell right back asleep on his bed, completely forgetting about his breakfast. The cat, who was watching all along, jumped up onto the table and lapped away at Francesco's delicious breakfast. Minutes must have passed, until suddenly a cloud floated by on its way to Turkmenistan. Why is it that clouds are so relaxed about crossing such dangerous borders? Maybe it's because, however hard they try, the North Koreans never once managed to shoot down a cloud trying to run away to south of the border. Or maybe it's because they just don't care a bit about such imaginary lines as borders. Clouds have been around thousands of years longer than any of today's crazy dictators, and don't even belong to the same species. What can a recently drawn imaginary line do to harm something as long-standing and noble as a cloud? Answer? Nothing. Except maybe try and make it evaporate because of electromagnetic fields or something? This is preposterous! shouted a Turkmenistani man, who was at that moment in his country of birth, Uzbekistan. Okay, that was a lie. He was actually in Kazakhstan. <laughs> All right, I'll stop it. He was in Turkmenistan. I can't believe that such a noble cloud and such a foreign item as this could make its way into our glorious nation. We must suit it down. So the man, who was in fact chief advisor to the dictator of Turkmenistan, called up the army, the navy, the air force, and the marines of Guatemala, and shouted at them. However, in Guatemala they don't speak with a lisp, and as such had huge trouble understanding what the dictator's chief advisor was trying to say. Of course they speak Turkmen fluently, but don't understand a word of it unless the S's and Z's are pronounced as they expect. Anyway, along came an interpreter and settled the matter after a couple of hours, and soon the entire military force of Guatemala was ready and waiting to shoot at the cloud. Unfortunately for them, it was long gone. Perhaps it had flown somewhere else, or perhaps it had merely disintegrated. Anyhow, this chapter so far has been but a distraction from the main purpose of the story, which is... Chapter 3. Hey, why did you cut me off like that? Oh well, I must admit, I didn't have an awful lot to say anyway. Chapter 4. No thanks, I'm going to start at chapter 3 again, and there's nothing you can do about it. So long, previous chapter deciding person. Chapter 3. The man woke up. Again. He decided that, as the last two chapters were so boring, he would go on an adventure. He got up out of bed, yawned, stretched out his arms, made himself a second breakfast, ate it, washed the dishes, dried the dishes, got dressed, thought a few moments on how he could possibly make this particular sentence any longer, brushed his teeth and yawned again, before opening the door to his cabin, going outside, closing the door, realising that there was a cat trapped inside, reopening the door, letting the cat out, and closing the door, completely out of breath at the immeasurably measurable length of the sentence he had just finished. Up went the sails, and, in response, down went the wind. The weather was as calm as a very calm thing. Isn't this a predicament? said old Frankie to nobody in particular. He had literally no idea what to do, even though he had just recently rowed back out to sea from the shore. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. the Storyteller. You're welcome to break the fourth wall any time you want to, Francesco. It's on me. Thus he set off once more, rowing forwards in a northern direction, until three seconds later when he got tired and completely out of breath. He looked up for any hope of distraction from whatever it was that the writer would choose to throw at him, but alas, t'was not to be. The sun was still rising in the predicted way, slowly, upwards, and in the east. He looked at the horizon in all directions, but found only the uninterrupted calm of the deep sea. He looked down into the sea itself and saw nothing but a few small fish darting into the shadow of Francesco's humble boat to avoid any potential birds which might have seen them. Around looked this non-sarcastically heroic protagonist for any such bird, but the skies were empty, except for a few thin clouds, not dissimilar to the previously mentioned one a chapter back. He could not believe that there was nothing at all to distract him from his loathsome task of rowing the 500 miles to Russia, but distraction was there none and he shrugged and picked up the oars. The not-mentioned animal poured at him, and he looked over to see the boat's motor having been attached to the back of the boat. This was convenient, seeing as it meant I wouldn't have to describe the whole long journey. Instead of describing the journey, I think I'll catch up with Douglas the Budgie, discuss how it came to live in China, and contemplate some philosophy in that order. The budgerigar, known simply as Douglas, pronounced Douglas, was chirping around in its cage, unaware of the traffic passing by in front of the shop in front of which was hanging its cage. It inspected the egg it had so accidentally laid all those sentences ago, cocked its head to the left and then to the right, flew about a bit, then it ate some seed. Reread this paragraph as many times as you can be bothered, as this is pretty much all Douglas ever did. 
A man walked past and remarked in Chinese, for Douglas the Budgie lived in China, But I can't tell you what that means because I do not, contrary to popular belief, speak Chinese. I can tell you for certain, however, that he wasn't explaining Douglas's backstory, as the only person who knows what happened is Francesco himself. Now that is an incredible tale, and as such I can't tell it to you, because if I did, the title wouldn't be the complete not a lie which I intended it as in the beginning. No, I'm not going to relate that story. I'm going to go straight back to Francesco on his boat. I'll describe all the nothings that happened to him for ten more chapters, and the budgie will be gone, forever, so that I don't accidentally reveal part of his journey to China. Oh, all right then, since you ask so politely. Here comes the incredible tale of Douglas, pronounced Douglas, and its owner, Francesco Zefkington Mefkington. One day, Francesco was in his hometown of Baku when he noticed a budgie vendor in the street. Being a very good-natured person, he bought one of the budgies being sold, went to China, said, Actually, I don't want to take care of a budgie. I'll bring Douglas, pronounced Douglas, to my good friend, shopkeeper I've never met before, so that she can have it for me. That's a good plan. So that's exactly what he did. If you want a more incredible tale than that, you must be absolutely mad. On to philosophy. <laughs> Isn't thinking fun? Meanwhile, back on the Caspian Sea, Frank DeBank was motoring north at the speed of boat. Just to the starboard of him, a couple of fathoms away, was a Russian fishing boat, merrily pillaging the depths of whatever was left in it after the great fish crisis thing of 1993. He could tell it was a Russian boat because of the Liberian flag it, and every single other boat in the world, was flying, but also because of the Russian flag it was flying. As she longed so dearly for company of any sort, Douglas, pronounced Srijaya Wardner Puracote, signalled to the fishermen in the code which only silly named cats and fishermen who fly multiple flags from their boat know. Unfortunately, Douglas accidentally made a typo, so the fishermen took the message as extremely offensive and scurried away, leaving nothing behind but awake. The sky was left the colour of sky, and the sea the colour of sea. The sails were down, the captain was reclining on a deck chair, reading Herodotus in the original Latin, and the motor smelt horrible and was on fire. Don't worry, he thought, it's in the water, can't actually catch fire, must be a mirage. The mirage spread to the back of the boat. Then the middle, the smell was absolutely overpowering. Then it vanished, as it was a mirage all along. You know, the sort of mirage that smells of smoke. And nothing continued to happen until the sun was about a degree up from the horizon and Russia began to appear on the horizon. Chapter 4 Wait, doesn't that mean that Russia was just to the west of him? Oh dear, let's see how this plays out. Chapter 4.5 No, this is still Chapter 4. I thought I sacked you earlier on, Mr. Chapter Deciding Person. Yes, well, no, I'm his replacement. But wasn't it me who took over from him? Ah, you see, you're not allowed to decide where chapters are anymore. Not since what happened two years ago. Alright, oh, of course. Sorry about this, readers. So why was it that you cut me off this time? Is it because I didn't begin the chapter with The Man? Yep, got it in one. All right then, but please let me begin chapter four again, you know, just for the sake of continuity in the story. Sure thing. Chapter four. The man. Wait, doesn't that mean that Russia was just to the west No, that's cheating. It needs to be a single closed sentence with the man as the subject. I thought that was the pattern you established. Now, this time, make sure to do it properly. Okay, then fine, I'll do it properly. Chapter four. The man hadn't realised something crucial. Seeing as the sun sets in the west, that must mean that what he thought was Russia was in fact to the west of him, except that he's just set off from near Baku in Azerbaijan, meaning that either he wasn't on the Caspian Sea at all, which he was, or that it wasn't even Russia in the first place. That's basic geography there. Now hold on a minute, just because I'm sitting here on this boat doesn't mean I can't hear you. Nowhere in that last paragraph of chapter 3 does it imply that the setting sun and Russia were on the same part of the horizon at all. The horizon's in all directions. The Russia I spotted was at around about 90 degrees clockwise from the setting sun in the direction that I'm going. Think about it, I'm going north towards Russia. Also, because I can hear what you say, don't try to pull any dramatic irony on me, because it won't work in the slightest. Alright, if you say so. Quite frustrated due to his angry rant at the author, Frankel decided that maybe a good night's sleep would be beneficial to helping him get back to his old cheerful self. He must be asleep by now. 
I don't think he can hear me when he's asleep. Anyway, that was far too much conversation in a book where there's only really supposed to be one character. Right, I think I'll describe the night. As the Earth's curvature slowly came to engulf the last remaining sector of the sun, the sky became dark enough for further stars to make themselves known. When you're so far away from major cities and all human light itself, more stars, obviously, can be seen. This means that, in spite of everything, the constellations most of us are vaguely familiar with are infiltrated by newcomers, sort of like moles on our skin we haven't noticed before, and the uneasiness resulting from this invasion of the familiar by external presences can confuse us, or excite us, or make us feel homesick, yearning for the known, the predictable, the third item of a tricolon, and all in all- Please just stop rambling for a minute, it's doing my head in. Can't you see I'm trying to sleep? Fine, I'll wait a bit longer. Roughly three hours. And, all in all, anyone could get overcome by this discomfort. But for others, this unfamiliarity can be totally exhilarating, and they dedicate their lives to trying to find more, new, never-before-seen experiences such as this, until it seems as though there are none left. In reality, however, there is always something new to find, but you will need to do things you would have never expected to do in order to find them. But let us not be disquieted by the prospect Look of- Look here, I was having a lovely dream, and you just had to interrupt. Maybe you should try having someone follow you around narrating everything you do sometime. Yeah, well, maybe you should get out of your cabin for a moment to take a look at the stars. You might enjoy it. <laughs> enjoy glimpsing the radiant orbs with wonderment? You really think so? I can't believe you sometimes. At that, with rebellious attitude filling his head, he obeyed orders and, an outlaw to authority, he daringly had a glance at the sky, then went back towards the door to the cabin. On the way, he hesitated and looked back up for a second. Wow, they really are so much brighter than at home. For once, I am actually glad I listened to you. So he stood there, in his pyjamas, for a few minutes, gazing up at each radiant orb with very wonderment. All right, so the stars are nice and all, he said at the end of those few minutes, but that doesn't excuse you doing all that rambling earlier on. I mean, seriously. Come on, it wasn't that bad. Yes, it was. Can you imagine anything more pretentious than going on about finding disquiet in unfamiliar stars and then going on some tangent about thrill-seeking? Look, if you want to narrate... It's not that I particularly want to narrate, it's that I'm contractually obliged to produce 13 chapters of this stuff. So, does that mean if I do all sorts of interesting things, the chapters will take shorter amounts of time to get through and you'll leave me alone sooner? I suppose so, but not too interesting, because I'm also contractually obliged to make sure there is no plot. Fine, but you really should choose your writing contracts more carefully. I had no choice in the matter. In fact, I was invented for the express purpose of writing this terrible story. What? Never you mind, go to bed now because it's time for... Chapter 5 The man went to... Hang on a second, why don't I have a say in when chapters begin and end? It's my story after all. Yeah, but... He's got a point, you know, said the official chapter deciding person. I mean, it does make sense if you think about it. Look, you two, this is my story, so I decide the writing. If it was your story, really, you could just cut out all this pointless arguing. All right, then, I will. Oh dear, it's in pen, so I can't. Never mind, it'll give me an increased word count, so I'm not complaining. The man went to bed and quickly fell asleep, because, would you believe it, he was actually pretty tired after all that wonderment and completely justified rambling about nothing in particular for the express purpose of artificially inflating the word count. Anyway, he was asleep again and dreaming about incredible, marvellous things. In his dream, he was bank manager at an extraordinarily managed bank somewhere in somewhere. Every day, he'd go out of his bedroom fully dressed in suit and tie and end up at a big room place full of desks, filing cabinets, ringing phones and employees. Upon at last sitting down at his desk, he would find a nice warm mug of perfectly normal green coffee and an already switched on computer which could do nothing but spreadsheets. Then he sat down at his desk and began typing mindlessly and continuously while staring, unblinking, at the screen. After an hour or so of hard work, someone called his name, so he sat down and replied, Yes, Vanessa? As soon as Vanessa told him there was a business, finance, important, serious call to attend to, he sat down and picked up the phone that had just appeared on his desk. On the other end was an incredibly posh, very serious, finance, bank, important person who promptly began saying very serious business things. Good evening, Francesco. £760,409.62. pence, one million eight hundred and fifty five thousand one hundred and forty four yen, sixteen thousand five hundred and eighty four dollars twelve cents. 
Good evening, Mr. Margate, Francesca replied at last. Three million eight hundred and thirty three thousand four hundred and twenty pounds ninety pence. Two hundred and seventy six thousand nine hundred and four euros fifteen cents. Nine hundred and ninety two rubles. 884,114 Swiss francs, 12 cents. 74 million euros, 29 cents. 5,013,204 rupees. Francesco sat down and said, 379,062 dollars, 2 cents. 8 Swiss francs, 1 cent. 24 yen. He put the phone down and sat down at last, quietly content. That was a very productive business call indeed. He sat down, took a sip of his normal red coffee, and leant back, grinning rather smugly, knowing that he was doing a superb job of managing his bank. Soon after that, he realised that he should carry on doing work, because there might be a power cut if he stopped for too long. So, he sat down and began typing frenetically into a spreadsheet. After a few minutes, it was morning again, so he reached over to open the curtains, through which opening, out jumped his cat, Strajai Wardenapurakote. Looking outside, Frank Spree saw that he was far above the ground, in a skyscraper somewhere in the desert. And Douglas the cat was falling. But Francesco was not phased, for he knew that cats are perfectly capable of surviving any fall. Indeed, when he turned back away from the window, there was Douglas again, lying contentedly on top of a lampshade. So back to work he went, sitting down several times in the process as the clock on the wall phased in and out of existence. Not long into this working session, he found himself inside his computer, which was composed of a climbing wall to his right, a gigantic window looking out onto nothingness on his left, and all around him was air, except below him. The climbing wall couldn't decide if it was red or blue, and to it, at very high altitudes, were pegged large cubular cardboard boxes. Francesco instantly realised that the only way to escape this place was by jumping into one of the cardboard boxes, so he sat down and hurried up the climbing wall. Although it seemed he was going at a blistering pace, progress was slow, and after several minutes he hadn't even gone a foot above the ground. To make matters worse, he spotted away to the left an annoyed gas man charging straight towards him. Luckily, he remembered that he could fly, so up he drifted and suddenly woke up. His first thought on arriving in bed was, Where's the box gone? And straight after that, his second thought was, How come I kept sitting down when I was already a sit? Then he fell straight back into a dreamless sleep. Outside on the boat, all was quiet. There was no wind and no waves. If you were there, all you could hear would be the sound of your blood pulsating. The statuesque, unmentionable, was manning a fishing rod and staring forwards, pondering deep, philosophical questions about consciousness and the nature of truth. In fact, he was so deep in thought that he didn't notice when the only fish that night tugged ferociously at the line and then escaped, making the loudest sound for miles. And the sky was mottled with wispy clouds, and the moon was new, and the stars sat millions of miles away, totally unaware of the tiny yacht beneath them. Which is of course to be expected, as they are millions of miles away, and not capable of knowing anything. So Unmentionable's thoughts kept meandering, and nothing at all was happening, and the author was clutching at straws for things to write about, etc, etc. Just then a storm blew up. No, he didn't. That was a lie. I suppose we may as well have some sort of a conversation. Well, I'll start. So, uh, how's your job going? Mine's quite a chore, I suppose. Always having to find something or other to write about while well, nothing at all is happening. Oh yeah, you can't respond because you're reading this in the future. So, how's the future going, I suppose? I've certainly got no idea about my future. This book... Surely no one will read it for the story. I'm having doubts about the meta-narrative about my contract and me being a fictional creation. Well, the contract is real, at least. But I'm pretty sure I'm not a fictional creation. After all, I'm the one writing the book. And the story's real, too. Francesco really is asleep on his boat. Well, I'm not now. Not since you started talking about meta-narratives and all that nonsense. Can you please just give me some peace and quiet for a moment? Okay, then. Fine. But, like it or not, I think it's about time for... Chapter 6. The man stared out into the open waters which surrounded his boat, willing with all his might that some plot might suddenly appear on the horizon to perhaps briefly punctuate his failed reality TV program of a life with something at least vaguely comparable to an interesting event. But nothing came, and so he continued to sit on his deck chair, forlornly watching the waves and waiting for nothing in particular to happen. 
Then, all of a sudden, he spotted an enormous pirate ship, stocked to the tips of the sails with cannons and rigging and other such piratic accoutrements. And it was heading straight towards Methgulbree's little yacht. No, it's not, rebutted Zefko. It's just another mirage, don't be silly. Also, what's a sudden? But it wasn't a mirage this time. Though the sea can project many and multifarious visions upon to the eyes of its observers indeed, this was the real thing. And our dear friend saw at last that the flags arranged on its masts spelt out in no uncertain terms, Francesco will pay. Wait, when did I learn to read flags? I don't know, you must have at some point. Anyway, at the helm of this fearsome ship, you could just make out the silhouette of someone very familiar indeed, the Gas Man. Presumably he hadn't stopped shaking his fist since the last time we met him. The veins in his arms bulged, his hand had turned white, and he could only muster one oscillation every two seconds, but he was angry for sure, and Francesco could tell. Okay, this time I'm genuinely worried, he announced as a cannon was rotated to face him. It can't be natural to write that way for so long. Can't you just use normal words for once? I mean, seriously, a ponst. Where on earth did you get that from? A right, being pointed at by a big cannon. But when he turned to look at the artillery that would surely be his end, it had all vanished. Pirate ship, the lot. Yep, just another mirage. Surely you must have known it was a mirage, said the irritated Frankster, fumbling about in his pockets for something. I mean, look, you somehow have the ability to speak to me with your disembodied voice and read my thoughts or something. Surely you must be coming up with all these ridiculous situations. Surely you're the one thinking up all these red herring bits of plot and putting me through them to see how I react. But then F.Z. McCam looked at his watch and realised it was two in the afternoon and he'd spent his entire morning looking out to sea for no reason. So he jumped back into the cabin and set about preparing lunch. Skipping towards the kitchen area, he checked the cupboards, just in case I had summoned into existence some exciting new ingredient for him to have a non-adventure with, but everything was normal. His food stocks were by no means running short, but they weren't exactly what you'd call varied. Two out of the three cupboards were packed with boxes of one particular branded Azerbaijani cereal, and the third contained an unopened jar of pickled onions. With great deliberation, he opened each door in turn and carefully inspected every carton, until he found at last the one that was already opened. This he placed on the table with utmost precision around about where he would be sitting. It didn't fall over. Then he selected a bowl and spoon from the draining board, a bottle of milk from the fridge, and assembled exactly his eating equipment. The bottle of milk fell over and spilt all over the table. No, wait, it didn't. Oh, actually it did. Or, sorry, it didn't. Or did it? Maybe Francesco had at last discovered Schrodinger's milk bottle, a quantum superposition of the binary states of spiltness and non-spiltness, simultaneously spilt and not spilt, until observed by someone from outside. Like Francesco, for example. For the record, it didn't actually spill. I saw it not spilling with my own eyes. His frantic gesticulations caught the bottleneck, and it tipped over, releasing its contents on the table, the floor, and the unmentionable animal. Whatever. Can you just shut up for a moment? No, I can't, and you know it, and you know exactly why I can't. In spite of his generally annoyed state that day, Friddles cleaned up the spill very quickly and set to eating his lunch without a care in the world. He soon came to realise he was glad that the pirate ship had only been a mirage. He was glad that here, on his yacht, he could sit and relax without anything major ever going wrong, because that would mean plot, and plot is forbidden by law, or something. At the end of lunch, he leant back in his chair for a snooze and let out a hiccough. Not a hiccup, mind you, but a hiccough. Somewhere between a hiccup and a cough. Maybe both happening at the same time. I'm not entirely sure how the mechanics of that would work, though. It'd sort of have to be letting air sharply out and in at the same time, which doesn't make all that much sense. Unless it was out through the nose and in through the mouth. I suppose that might make a bit more sense than out through the mouth and in through the mouth at the same time. But where on earth might Francesco have learnt the ancient didgeridooist's art of circular breathing? Well, Australia, obviously, but has Francesco even been there? And if he has, what is the likelihood he had didgeridoo lessons? Not that high, I should think. I suppose he might have done it accidentally, that's possible. But wait, if it was out through the nose, it can't have been a cough at all, it would have been a sneeze. His sneeze, not a great word. Hick sneeze isn't much better. All right, another possibility is that it's sort of a cough added to a hiccup. How might that work? Well, if you take the cough part as, say, plus one, and the hiccup part as minus one, and you add them together, you get naught. So nothing happened at all? That doesn't sound like a very satisfying solution to me. What about if you take the average of a cough and a hiccup? Still naught. Hmm. 
Well, coming back to the idea of Schrodinger's bottle, it could be a quantum superposition of two states, cough and hiccup. They're both equally happening until someone observes either one happening. Now, did Francesco observe... Just shut up! Stop talking about quantum superheroes! I'm sorry, Frindlebeck, I really am. I hate all this nonsense as much as you do. I know absolutely no one in their right mind will want to read a word I've written, but I write anyway, because I sort of have to. This is just filling space. You know it, I know it, but please forgive me. Just allow me one more page of blithering before I end the chapter. Just let me reach my quota, and I'll leave you alone for the rest of today. Frankenstein closed his eyes again, slowly. He let out a sigh and leant back, dejected-faced, on his chair, as he tried to regain his composure and his state of relaxation. And outside, a slight wind blew up and made the bits of metal on the boat begin to rattle tentatively. Douglas the cat stretched, got up, and slowly walked out onto the deck. Above, the sky was an infinite blue and fairly clear. Slight clouds were being slightly blown northwards towards the boat by the slight wind. Not as a warning or anything, just... There. There was a small puddle of water sitting on the deck, about which a fly was buzzing. That eventually evaporated and joined the deep blue sky. By now the cat was lying upside down in the sun's warmth, not waiting for anything to happen, just soaking up the now. The fly landed on the cat's cheek and wandered about a bit. The cat almost tried to brush it away, but didn't really mind enough to do anything. Out in the water, a splash broke the laxness of the moment with tension as ripples diffused out from where a fish's nose had reached the interface with the air. But this was no distraction, and no tension to the languid cat whatsoever, who simply lay there absorbing the dry of the sun. And inside the cabin sat, slouching, a sleeping man, exhausted by his inactivity, absorbed by his eventless life. He snored a little. And the author, sitting at his table, resolved to make the next chapter a silly one. Chapter 7 The man got up and looked circumspect, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Walls, door, table, chairs, portholes, kitchen, raging fire! Okay, yes, it was just a mirage. Sorry, won't do that again. He walked over to the table and leant his hand on it as he pondered what to do that day. It didn't take him very long to decide on actually sailing somewhere and not getting distracted by anything wacky and silly along the way. Now, which direction hadn't he tried yet? South would do. Already dressed, he got up and went outside, neglecting breakfast for the meantime as he wasn't very hungry. He set up the sails and proceeded to manoeuvre his little boat to face south. While he was adjusting the rudder, a sudden thought came to his mind. He stopped, jumped with more energy than he had ever had in the past few months to the middle of the deck, stood up straighter than he had since posture lessons at home all those years ago, and declaimed, hands raised in despair in spite of the manic grin which had materialised on his face, in a voice louder than any he had used to shout at me in annoyance before, looking out to the horizon, I am mad! I'm completely mad. I constantly hear this voice narrating my life. I keep seeing these ridiculous mirages. I have dreams where where I say amounts of money in various currencies for no reason. I name my pets seriously idiotic things. I, I get on a yacht and sail to the middle of a lake to avoid my problems. I've only got the problem because I bought a flipping yacht instead of paying my gas bill. I'm just mad. That explains everything. I lost my marbles the day I was born. Just mad. As soon as he finished his self-tirade, Flank sat down, out of breath, not quite believing what he'd just said. Most of all, he couldn't believe he'd just let the inexplicable disembodied voice know the source of his debt. The disembodied voice stopped for a second, contemplating whether what had just happened counted as plot, and that revelation about Francesco's past as a plot twist. The author couldn't make up his mind about the latter, but he came to the conclusion that as long as nothing came of that madness thing later on in the book, and it wasn't mentioned again, it wasn't plot, and he was safe. Just then, don't worry Francis Bacon, said a new voice, small compared to that last event. Oops, just called it an event, I hope the publisher doesn't hold that against me. But compared to the near silence of the wind, the most significant sound of all. You're not mad, you're quite sane. Sure, you've made a couple of mistakes, but this narrator is not your fault. You did not invent him, nor did he choose to torment you. It's all just bad luck on your part, I'm afraid. Once he felt he had sufficiently calmed down, Fran raised his head and turned to the left to see who this newcomer, inexplicable like the rest of his incredible bubble, adventure, bubble, bubble, bubble. was. And there, hovering in the air about a yard from him, was the most blandly stereotypical fairy imaginable. She smiled a bit. Francesco buried his head in his folded arms. Another mirage, right, he said, as dejected as muffled. 
No, I said I wouldn't do that again. It was getting trite very quickly. And it's definitely not plot, Ben. Well, I'll try my best to make sure it isn't. After a few seconds, the fairy spoke up. So, what exactly is the situation you two are in, then? It's complicated, Francesco started. I can't even say I really know myself. I finished. Come on, you can at least try and explain. After a long sigh, he began. So I got on this yacht, right, to escape from the gas man so I wouldn't have to pay my bill to him, and ever since, this disembodied voice has been following me about and narrating everything that happens to me as if it was a book. No, I don't know why either. He finished and turned his head to the left again, but the fairy had totally vanished. He sighed again for about ten seconds and buried practically his entire body in his folded arms. The words, another stupid mirage, could just be made out from his muffled voice. I'm truly sorry, I'm simply running out of ideas. You've been running out of ideas ever since I opened the envelope, he suddenly snapped, face angrier than I had ever seen it before. Then off he stormed, back to the cabin, accidentally kicking the cat on the way. He stayed in there smouldering away for about an hour. Meanwhile, the sky remained blue and cloudless, the north wind pleasantly breathing into the sails. A beautiful day for anyone not called Zefkington McMefkington. The sun, high and slightly to the southeast, showed no sign of moving. It bothered no one and no one bothered it. It just sat there, in space, radiating its millions of terawatts in every direction, just so that a minuscule fraction shone upon Earth, and a fraction of a fraction upon a silly little boat on a lake in Central Asia with no one else around for miles. I should be more specific. Priscilla Yakubova sat in her fishing boat on Lake Balhash, patiently waiting. Still, nothing was biting. She began to hum a song she had first heard a couple of days ago and liked quite a lot. She couldn't remember how the chorus went, though, so as soon as she got to the end of the verse, she would start back at the beginning. This was odd to her, because it was usually the choruses that she remembered in songs, the catchier melodies, the more exciting instrumentation, the memorable lyrics, and she seemed to remember that this song had a particularly good chorus. In fact, that was the part that had made this one of her favourites, and yet she couldn't think how it went. In pondering this, a fish managed to slip off the line when she wasn't looking. She felt the tug and cursed her inattentiveness. Not that it really mattered. Another fish was sure to arrive soon, and this one she wouldn't miss. She started humming again. Just then the author left Priscilla behind in her boat, because he'd grown tired of how out of tune her humming was. So it was back to the Caspian Sea and Fritzelheimer VIII and his boat and his cat and definitely no one else. Definitely. By this time, Anne Frank had got over his spell of madness and was in good spirits. The wind was in his back, though I'm not entirely sure how it all fitted in there, and the motor had decided not to be temperamental today. He passed a jolly boater on the right and waved happily. The jolly boater made a rude gesture in return, but he kept waving, unshaken nonetheless. Isn't it nice to feel you're actually going somewhere? He asked a certain unmentionable animal, who definitely wasn't there. Makes a change, doesn't it? The unmentionable animal replied, passively. Or at least that's what Francesca Cathedral decided he would have said, had he not been unable to speak, being a certain unmentionable animal, of course. So where are we going this time? Said a certain unmentionable animal, for real this time. Okay, that was just me. Probably shouldn't have done that. Now the phantom sound of me doing a do unmentionable animal voice will haunt me for the rest of my life. Not to worry, I probably won't exist anymore by the time this book is published. What? Nothing. Frandall bars nothing. Ignore what I just said. So the boat boated along at the speed of motor, the seascape constant and unchanging in spite of the distance covered. Behind them, somewhere to the right, a flock of seagulls could be heard. It was all very idyllic. Sir Mefkins picked up his four-month-old newspaper and finally set about reading it after having left it all this time for whatever reason. A couple of minutes in, he realised it had been upside down the whole time. No wonder he couldn't make head or tail of it. But he could now, and images of foreign wars and stock exchanges and naive celebrities filled his content-with-solitude mind. Chapter 8 The man could smell something odd. From behind the newspaper, it suddenly occurred to him that there was a strange, malodorous something not far away. When he eventually decided that he couldn't pretend it was some sort of ridiculous mirage out to torture his poor, messed up mind, he firmly set down the paper, causing an uncomfortable sounding jolt from the table, and went outside to have a look. And all that he could see was clouds, sky and water, etc, etc. This puzzled him somewhat. That smell had only arisen within the last few minutes, as far as he could tell, and yet nothing seemed to have arrived in that time to perform its low-rent practical jokes on that unwitting fool of a Francescanator. Oh, that was a bit wordy, wasn't it? Well, sorry, but just you try to write a silly novella-type thing without using words. I've tried, it didn't work, and I'm fairly sure you wouldn't have much more luck than me if you gave it a go. The act of writing kind of presupposes that words are going to be involved in some capacity, 
And when you've got 13 empty chapters to fill, good luck pulling off anything decent without a couple of words poking their annoying little metaphorical noses into everything they just so happen to come across. Sorry, I'm doing it again, aren't I? Alright, let's just give this another go, shall we? Chapter 8. The man could smell something. Now look here, I'm not going through this whole rigmarole all over again just because some third-rate author wants to have another go at the chapter without being distracted by... by... something. I don't know, just... what am I trying to say here? Oh yeah, get on with it. Such a brash display of blatant hypocrisy had as yet never been seen on the Honourable Vessel, as the good Francesco Esquire wandered about, nose aloft, searching in vain for the elusive source of that distracting fragrance, and he was also trying to find where the smell was coming from. Eventually he gave up and began putting up the sails. Why? It was something to do. It felt right at the time. And so he put up each sail one by one, stumbling occasionally. One time he lost a bit of rope, but Stretch Douglas the cat pointed it out when she was found dangling over the side of the boat, emitting strange muffled bubbling noises and clutching the end between her teeth. With his very best fishing impression out of the way, Frangelbars finally got the sails all put up. He stood back, hands on hips, admiring his handiwork. Checked his watch. A bit slower than his personal record, but a decent time nonetheless. Once he'd got tired of standing there, he proceeded to take the sails back down, ready for the next time he would decide to check his agility was up to scratch. With that convenient distraction over with, he remembered the smell, which had actually got slightly more potent over the last few minutes, believe it or not. By this point, it was impossible to ignore wherever you happened to be on the boat. It had even diffused out as far as 50 yards from the yacht itself. Francesca United had actually swum that for himself, just to check. Now, even more desperate and with soaked clothes weighing him down doubly, he got out his special X-ray radar goggles, which he's had all the time, by the way. They were hiding behind a cereal packet so you couldn't see them, and looked in the one direction he still hadn't looked. Under the hull. And what did he find under the hull? Well, that's a secret for a whole nother time. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same place, to find out what will happen to Pope Francis in the next exciting episode of The Incredible Tale of Francesco Zeffington McNeffington and... Redacted. Now, you better have stopped reading at this point. You don't want the next episode spoilt for you, do you? So stop reading and calmly put the book away before someone realises you've been looking for spoilers. Shame on you. You ought to be reading this tomorrow like everyone else. Just because you can doesn't mean you should be ruining the experience for all the people reading this at the time they're supposed to. Leave it till tomorrow, okay? Good. That means it must be tomorrow now. Not for Francesco, for you. That's an important distinction to make. Right, so he's just used his x-ray goggles to look underneath the boat and there was a cliffhanger. And now we're about to reveal what exactly it was that he saw there. Good. So, everyone happy with that? Okay, let's get going then. Chop, chop. Don't waste any more time, and we're ready to start again in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Places, everybody. 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy New Year! Oh. <clears throat> Alright, he's got his goggles on, and it pans towards his eyes. Then we get a shot of what he's seeing through the goggles, and there's a sort of green tint with all these technical looking overlays and electronic sound effects. And he's looking around, and then eventually it stops, and we zoom into the bottom of the boat. Now he adjusts some settings, and we begin to see as the floor blurs away what it is we've been waiting for all this time. But before we can quite make out what it is, boom! Cue opening credits. And that's the audience hooked. Alright, any questions? Everyone fine with that? Good. So let's- Francesco couldn't find anything on the boat. Oh well, there must be somewhere he hadn't checked yet. In the cupboards? No. Under his bed? No. He even picked up his chest of drawers and looked underneath and behind it. Only dust. And not even that much of that. He sniffed the dust just to be sure. Nope, only normal, old, boring dust, all up in his nose. He sighed. He leant back on his bed, and the smell had grown even worse, but he was finished with it. If he hadn't found it yet, what chance did he have of finding it, even after he'd double-checked every last crevice of that little boat of his? Now, generally, this is the point where it suddenly appears out the corner of his eye, and it's somewhere really obvious, so he slaps his forehead and goes, How can I not have checked there? And then everyone has a bit of a laugh, and we're all friends again. I'll give you a clue, that's not what happens this time. Or is it? No, it's not. Frustrated and confused, he inched his way down until he was lying, flat on his back, staring up at the ceiling through nearly shot eyelids. He tried to sleep. His nose resisted. He tried to avoid his nose's torment. It punched him in the face, metaphorically. He was out of patience, out of luck, and out of any real kind of thoughts. Ephemeral nothings passed through his neurons, generated and disappearing within seconds. Couldn't think. Too much smell. Too much tiredness. Too much apathy. He got up and finally started triple-checking every last spot on the yacht. Every square foot of the sea. Every point on the horizon. There was nothing there. Nothing to cause such a stink. Such a disastrous form of olfactory mind game as this. Nothing to... 
Just then the cat walked in, carrying a very large, very, very mouldy piece of cheese. Being the good-natured man that he is, he shouted at Douglas for not finding it earlier potty. and shredded the cheese eight times in a row, fully conscious of the fact that it would make his shredder smell quite bad. Then he took the shreddings and threw them overboard. The daredevil evil Knievels of the fish world tentatively approached the spot where the grated cheese was slowly sinking, but even they were cautious enough to leave after a minute or so. Chapter 9 After all this time, the man still hadn't noticed the mysterious box under his bed, which was making the author slightly nervous. At any time, Frumatism could discover it and the many secrets it hid, and that, like it or not, would mean plot. Keen to avoid such a terrifying prospect, the author decided to quickly change the subject, attempting to perpetuate the perpetuation of the myth that Frillestein's boat was in fact an ordinary boat. Now, hold on a second, he said at exactly the moment the reader was expecting him to, but I believe I have looked under my bed less than a chapter ago. No mysterious box then, and I'm sure about that. Nevertheless, simultaneously intrigued and worried the reader might think him gullible, he couldn't help but tentatively pace towards his bed, looked underneath. There sat an unassuming cardboard box. Or did it? Yes, it did, and I've already done that pseudo-joke, so I don't think it's going to get any real reaction this time around. France sat back up, puzzled. The author's inexplicable extrasensory perception, so it seemed, knew no bounds. Now it was creating and distorting reality at will. Worrying, especially for Will. That's definitely a real box, he checked again. And it definitely, definitely wasn't there before. Definitely. So how did... Wait a moment! This was the chapter deciding person. That first sentence. More than one clause. Have you forgotten the rules or something? This was established all the way back in chapter four. What are we on now? Seven or something? Anyway, go back and change it. You're a bit late today, aren't you? I've already got a couple of pages in, so I'm not just going to say none of that ever happened. And... Wait a moment while I rifle through some pages. <laughs> Yes, chapters 6 and 7. Both of those started with a multiple clause sentence, and you didn't even contest me on that. And why are you so late, anyway? Hmm? Oh yes, sorry, I was asleep. I can't have noticed. Oh well, we can go back and change those later, but for now, I'm awake, and I'm the one with the authority around here, not you. But and don't you go being all etymology Jones and saying that since you're the author, you must have authority by definition, because that's not funny, and nor is it a valuable use of time. Actually, that's not what I was going to say. I was about to bring up the fact that several chapters have started and ended while you were asleep. Who did that then? Seriously. <laughs> you two. There's a mysterious box here, and you're not giving me any time to even open it. I must have done it in my sleep, I suppose. Only rational explanation. Why is that relevant? Well, if you weren't the one deciding those chapters, it must have been me. And since there was no consequence to that, then your job is basically redundant. Don't make me remind you about what happened last time. There is a very good reason why my job is necessary, and I don't want to have to explain it to you all over again. Actually, you never explained it the first time. But what I'm saying is, if there has so far been nothing terrible happening because I've been deciding when my own chapters should begin and end, then why shouldn't I just keep on as before? It's just been proven that nothing bad's gonna happen. Mysterious box under the bed? I understand your argument, but there is no saying that simply because nothing occurred after, what, three chapters under your command? That doesn't mean it is impossible that any adverse effects might be affected. Look, anyway, I said I must have been doing all this in my sleep, so what is even the trouble? The trouble is, if you were even listening, that this is my book and I'm the one writing it, so it makes absolutely no sense that some anonymous bureaucrat should somehow have better judgement as to the course of a book than the book's own writer. And why should it be you in particular anyway? Why not Simon Cowell? Or Jane Austen's great-great-great-great-great-granddaughter? Or, or, I don't know, Callum Giles from Dulwich? What's so special about you? It's sort of my book. It is named after me. There's nothing special about me or anything. I was appointed by the panel. They said I had the relevant qualities for this job, and so I was chosen to do it. That sounds like plot to me. Now shut up before something significant happens. Oh, wow. That actually worked. Sorry about that, Francesco. Right, box. Francesco reached under his bed and pulled out the mysterious box, eager and relieved, yet just as cautious. When it was halfway out, there came a ring of the doorbell. Haha, <laughs> got you, it was that one in China. He did that one before as well, he muttered. Just then the cat walked in, carrying a dead seagull. Francesco scolded the cat and put her out, shutting the cabin door. Right, get all your distractions out of the way soon, because you can't avoid the inevitable. I'm going to open that box and there's nothing you can do about it. Just then the cat walked in through the slightly ajar door, carrying a dead seagull. I thought I'd shut that door properly, he said, as he repeated the rigmarole. Look, I understand why you're doing this, scared of plot and all that, but the box is probably empty anyway. Please let me open it. All this tension probably counts as plot at a stretch anyway. 
Just then, the cat walked in. I thought I'd shut that flipping door! Clutching the same dead seagull. It was at this point Francesco realised the latch on the door didn't fit properly into its hole. Better get that mended later. Anyway, box. Mysterious. Under bed. Get. Just then, the- Look here, Sonny Jim. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Don't bring dead seagulls into the cabin while I'm trying to get a box out from under my bed. But it wasn't a dead seagull. This time the cat had brought in... Okay, it was the same dead seagull. Apparently my supposed reality distorting powers aren't as strong as all that. Anyway, Friar Zuck Muck Muck manhandles Dodger out of the, the cabin, Burkotti. all the while cursing under his breath. He ripped the dead seagull out of the accursed animal's mouth and threw it out, into the sea, as far away as possible, where a funeral party of its kin soon gathered to pay their respects. Francesco gave Street Douglas the cat a good old-fashioned talking to and sent her away with a warning before getting back down to box-shaped business. He pulled at it until it was nearly halfway out. Could he bear the anticipation? Only one way to find out. More anticipation! Just then the cat walked in, carrying a dead seagull, a different one. Unfortunately, Francesco didn't take the bait. He ignored this exciting new development and pulled the box out all the way. He opened it. It was empty all along. Oh, now I remember why I'd brought along this empty box, he said. And there he sat, remembering. And he kept remembering until he eventually forgot. Then he remembered again. How exciting. Obviously, I mustn't have noticed it before, somehow. So he put it back. Chapter 10 after that exciting, totally not plot, box episode, the man clauses. As I was saying, the man felt the sudden urge to Come on, that's too many clauses! Is it so difficult to write a sentence without putting a comma in the middle? Oh, crikey, what can I do to get that guy out of my hair for a second? Well, for one, you could follow the rules and make sure that each chapter's opening sentence only has one clause. Like, how is that difficult? It's not that it's difficult or anything, it's just that I disagree on principle. Why should I have to follow a totally arbitrary set of restrictions when it's my own work I'm doing? This is, believe it or not, my story. My story? It's right there in the title. Exactly, Francesco. My story. These rules are anything but arbitrary, unnamed author. I'll have you know, the committee spent weeks worth of meetings deciding the optimum set of regulations. And besides, it's based on a clearly defined pattern you yourself initiated. Be that as it may, my book, my rules, in it. No. Well, it is though, isn't it? What makes you think that? No, it isn't. Uh, but it obviously is. I mean, obviously. Look, it isn't. And that's final. And I'm in charge here, alright? You're not the one in charge. It's my book. I'm the one writing it. I am the one in charge. I was put in charge, so I'm in charge. Got it? It's so blindingly simple. No possible way of misinterpreting. Unless you're me, apparently. Now, look, I've got a chapter to write here. You want me to write chapters, don't you? So let me just have this one. Alright, you win this time. Good. With that thinly veiled attack on bureaucracy and the establishment, whatever that means, out of the way, Fracture of the Skull was beginning to get itchy feet. Are you pleased with me for managing to stay quiet for most of that argument? He said. Yes, you've been a very good boy, for I can't think of a nickname. Well done. We'll discuss your treat later. How much later is later? Pfft, after I finish the book, I suppose. That sounds fair to me. Hang on now, said Chapter Man TM. I thought you said you'd get back to writing just now. Do it. This is writing, isn't it? Unless the definition changed when I wasn't looking. Besides, all this stalling is pretty much the best way I know of filling up space on a page without any plot rearing its ugly head. Ugh, fine, carry on. So, about that treat of yours, along what sort of lines were you thinking of in terms of that? Hmm, well, I don't know. I think you should choose. After all, you're the one who apparently has reality-altering powers. And you said you'd discuss all this after the book was finished. Still three and a bit chapters left, aren't there? Yes, I suppose I did say that. I'll just fall back on my old standby of pointlessly describing the surroundings again. That usually seems to work just fine. Sounds good to me, said the oddly agreeable protagonist. So Francesco sat and watched the clouds go by. He wondered whether any of them was the same one as caught the attention of the Turkmen Guatemalan Coalition all those chapters ago. Then he realised that would be impossible, as there was a north wind, which meant today's clouds would have come from the north. Then he began to consider whether any of that old cloud's water molecules had been inherited by this new batch, which led him to consider a certain question. Is there any use in comparing one water molecule to another, when they're all indistinguishably identical and freely interchangeable, and so small there's no possible way of directly perceiving it? So he pondered this subject, and moved on to weigh up several contrasting nihilistic and platonic philosophies of existence. All Hang this... on just one more second. You said you describe the surroundings, not frabjous over his thoughts. Consistency, man. Fine. 
The sky was blue, the sea was green, the clouds were brown, the fish were there probably, and so were the birds, and there were waves on the sea, and the sun existed, and the sea was technically a lake, and there was a boat, and that's barely even a description. You can do better than that. Heck, I could do better than that, and I don't even- So why don't you give it a go then? Seeing as apparently you want this book done as much as I do. Well, you know. Sure, just give it one little attempt. I suppose... It'll be fine. I'll even write you an opening sentence to get you going. So the author got up and let the chapter decide to take control of the keyboard. He began to type. Chapter 11. The man. And you're not starting a new chapter. Just because you're the one doing the writing now doesn't mean this isn't still my book. I had a good thing going with chapter 10 and I'm not going to let you ignore it. Why did I bother transcribing that? Now that I'm the one writing, I can do this as professionally as I like. Now, where's that delete key got to? There isn't a delete key on this keyboard. That explains so much. In fact, that explains a worryingly plot twist-like amount. Hmm, I suppose I could try using Control x What? Why on earth would that of all things be disabled on this computer? That's been standard for decades now. Just let me... Well, at least this is all contributing to the word count. Let's try this another way. Dear reader, please kindly disregard everything from chapter 11 up to this paragraph. How's that? It'll do. So, what was it I was going to write? Well, you took over from me because you thought you could do a better job than me at describing a CC over his surroundings. I've been waiting very patiently here on my boat for you to do this description. Yes, you have been very good, Francesco. About that treat. So, anyway, the sky was the kind of blue that... The save icon on this document is. Probably. And so was the sea. Lake. And there wasn't a cloud in the... No, wait, there was. That was being discussed earlier. So there was a cloud, or several, and they were definitely in the sky, and Francesco was still in his boat for some reason, and how much longer do I have to keep going with this? You can let me take over again if you like. No, no, I've got a point to prove. Just give me a sec. A mile south of downtown Little Rock, a fire hydrant grows out of the sidewalk where, hours earlier, a passing dog achieved enlightenment. A brisk cluster of dogwood leaves bustles by its deep fall. A government helicopter pretends not to be a UFO. The mom and pop store had a rough day. It's almost dark already. My office sweats the sweat of my ancestor's brow, solitary and frantic. The printer takes a breather. Two more scrawny little hours and we can clock out. All the interesting websites are blocked. It's fine. I'm fine. I'll be fine. Just give me a sec. The cursor flickers. 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 Six years now. The cursor flickers. The cursor flickers. It's been six concerned years. Longest sec I've ever heard of. But they pay me. So, you know, it's enough to get by. The cursor flickers. The cursor flickers. The cursor flickers. Still on the Zefka Simon, huh? He puts his hand on my shoulder. Mm-hmm, that's what they pay me for. Stare at the monitor all day, beg it, coax it, hope it into producing some words. For six years. Six gosh darn tootin' years. Eesh, it's a rough one and no mistake. We've all got your back, buddy. I've seen him come back from longer breaks than that. It happens. It happens. I got the report just a half an hour ago. Says you're on top of things. Good to hear. Keep up the good work, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Nobody could do the work better than you, they say. And let me just interpose here. We're proud to have such a safe pair of hands in you, man. Say it ain't so, buddy, you old scalawag. He tousles my hair. He leaves to make his next coffee. The dog from earlier walks by again, sniffs the fire hydrant. He stops to paint it yellow, but then doesn't. He turns toward me. The printer stops wheezing. The streetlight flickers. He smiles, starts panting, cheerfully. He nods. The cursor flickers, the cursor flickers, the cursor flickers, the streetlight flickers. He moves on. The man. 
Boss? I'm not your boss. It's happened. We got a new chapter. Oh hell yeah, buddy. He hits me on the back a bit too hard and some coffee ends up in my sleeve. Well, you know what to do, don't you? It's been a year or two, but no way has my boy forgotten his training. You know what to do. Just let your reflexes take over. You'll be A-OK, -okay, champ. I already did it. Oh, cool. My eyes almost glaze over with tears as chapter 12 is born before them, innocent and beautiful. No matter what the higher-ups think, no matter how they try to beat me down, no matter the cost, spiritual and physical, no matter the intrusion and the coercion, the whiplash and the drudgery, the tragedy of being a replacement's replacement and the Damocles' sort of replaceability, I am truly the king of love. I was born for this moment, for these days, this feeling. The prose is sweet, naive, coy and knowing, artlessly artistic and endlessly autistic, rebounding off topics like a knife through trampolines, stuck and yet glorying in its freedom. This family, this heritage, through centuries of toil, we were chosen and elevated for fatherhood, and fatherhood has blessed us at last. Who's this? said Freund's Beans, looking up from the little pool of water he'd been pretending his little thing was having a little swim in. Um, what was all that about? I thought I was daydreaming. It was a bit like the bank dream, I thought. Well, Franciscanism, that was obviously... You see, it was the... Um, I wonder if you... If there's anything, you know, and if you actually... Of course... The man was rather, you know, rather un... Rather unaccustomed to, to, to these kinds of... These sort of... And if you really... There's someone sending me messages from America. Someone in an office, sitting at a computer being very boring and very American. You see, it's not just, but it's also, no, wait, hang on, just one moment, just one moment. I actually think I had it wrong there. This time, that time, that last couple of time, and it's really only... And furthermore, this person is watching you type, except apparently you hadn't said anything for six years. Which has got me wondering, have I been frozen in time for six years? And if so, has the world around me progressed six years? And... If so, how come nobody seems to have done anything to me on my yacht while I was frozen? All that said, it was probably just a mirage, let's be honest. How is Arkansas the dog getting on, I wonder? Can't have gone far. Yes, Senator. Uh-huh. I hear you, Senator. All right, understood. Well, men, we're gonna have to execute the 4122 protocol. Action stations, on my order. <laughs> Beautiful work, stunning work, my child, my child, my child, my long last child, such sinuous verse, such pristine metaphor. I had not known love till I knew these words, but I now know and see and feel these words, and love is mine at last, at long last. Uh, buddy, you're getting drool on the keyboard, sport. No incantation that ever arose from the fount of the Alaniades could ever match the spell here engraven in its simplicity, but perfection, woven from the very strands of consciousness to survive and surpass the human condition in all its myriad complexities, and yet instantly attuned to all life, all being, nor an iota, nor a perispomony out of place. Hold up. This is garbage. This is absolute trash heap dung pile garbage with biscuits and gravy. Six years and this is what it's done to him. Poor fella. What about this part? Look it. He even went and mentioned the... Oh god. Helicopter. We're not safe, buddy. Get your jacket on. Pronto. He's only gone and done it. Get up, son. Come on already.
well, there was and there was and there was and there was. <laughs> Wasn't there? Yes, there was. It was the other, the other, the other ones. The other what? The others, yes, the others. And they, but they, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, yes, I'm waiting for it to all, for it to all, for it, yes, for it to it, 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 for it to, to all. I'm sorry. Can I but, can I but, I can't, but can I but, what? The man looked in his cupboard for something to do. After pushing various bits of plastic chaff to the side, a book came into view, and he opened it. This was an old recipe book that had originally belonged to an old maiden aunt of his. At one point it had been laminated like a library book, some of the chaff being the direct result of this lamination, plus one and a half generations worth of mistreatment. He diligently thumbed through the recipes, starting somewhere just before the middle of the book, scrutinising each one for some ounce of memory, half a teaspoon of vague familiarity to anoint himself with. The page where he stopped was printed with a woodcut illustration of those little plain cakes called madeleines. He thought nothing of it, nor of any of the other recipes, and set about finding his pen. It had rolled out of the cabin, and was dangerously rolling about on the deck, several times only the reflexive dexterity of the cat had kept it from glupping overboard, and now again it was intercepted by Sir Douglas's clever paw. Contain. She stared up at Frank the man with a sort of, so what are you going to do about that then, expression, meowed for emphasis, and Francesco prized the pen out from between the floor and strangely powerful paw, trying to give Douglas a nice scratch behind the ears with the shaft of the pen, which didn't work. The scratch, not the pen. The pen worked. It was a good pen, and it had served him very well indeed on his many misadventures up to this time, thank you very much. Back in the cabin, he opened the recipe book to a different, random page, and started filling in the gaps in the letters. Lowercase g's were great fun to do. When you finish a lowercase g, it looks like a weird pair of sunglasses. It looks heavy, beany, like you could chuck it around and catch it in interesting ways. But it did make the word filling look uneven and malnourished. He wondered whether he should fill in the numbers as well as the letters. <laughs> yeah, of course, obviously. 40 minutes would look very strange with only the E coloured in. But what about the clock icon just to the left? Where does one stop? That's a symbol that conveys meaning, and it's got one nice big gap to fill. But then you'd end up with a big black circle of nothing, and what would be the point of that? Also, if you think about it, the whole page is a sort of gap, framed by the outside world and his knee. Maybe that should be coloured in as well. He coloured in the clock and turned to the next recipe, ignorant of the italic K in cooking that remained un -de gapped Oh, thanks for picking that one up. Of course, any time. The pen scratched its way through seafood, through savoury pastries, through the essay about pressure cookers that no one had ever truly, properly read before, through the one and a half pressure cooker recipes, and by the time it reached jams and preserves, it was scratching. Filling in gaps was a lot less satisfying when the ink came out grey and marbled, but he didn't want to abandon the pen just yet. An instant thought reminded him of the classic, find the author photo and give them facial hair and glasses, and it felt right. He found the author at the back of the book, on a folded over bit of card which was no longer attached to the cover, apart from the thinnest causeway of a paper hinge. Yellow vestiges of sellotape, glue smooth yet coarse, showed where Aunt Doreen or Maureen, but probably not Chlorine, had once repaired it. Taking with them the chef's first initial, qualifications and awards, the top left corner and bottom third of the card were missing. But the glasses weren't. Those were big, thick-rimmed 50s numbers, grey-white on face grey, so solid you could almost feel them embossed on the card. Ones that would fall to the ground with the crash of a felled oak, if not for their plier-like grip on the nose and the forest of a Santa Claus beard cradling them in the branches of its canopy. So Francesco extended the outer frame of the glasses to make him look like Elton John. Then he closed the book. By now it was around four o'clock outside with the wintry sun low and widening out to a frozen fruit juice ellipse, and the low wind chilling the languorous sails. Crouched low at the base of the cabin's outer wall, Douglas Sweet the Cat contemplated how to acquire more pens for her fun new game, the one where they all roll about and you have to keep them from falling over the edge and going chglup. The pen Professor F had just been using chose that moment to finally disembark on the irreversible voyage from a surface level to a deeper understanding of reality, and quietly rolled a direct path from the cabin floor all the way along the deck into the water, where it silently sank. A passing fish noticed it, who didn't know what to make of all these strange recent occurrences and thought it prudent to blame the whole thing on the government. No one else saw it go. Its enlightenment was as it intended a private and deeply personal affair.
Thankfully, there was a stash of pens stowed away in a semi-obscure section of Francesco's luggage, which he'd actually discovered while I was describing the cat's fun new game. These were from the same pack as the first one, top-notch ballpoint wonders, as Aunt Phyllis, which was her real name, used to call such things in her less lucid moments. Full of potential and, much more importantly, ink. He continued defacing his recipe book from page one, which went nothing at all like the man opened an envelope, it was white and had a plastic window on the front through which you could see the address, because it was a recipe book. But the thought did remind him of the dear old gas man and his dear old obsession with being paid. It has been rather a long time since I last saw him. Even longer, not counting that mirage a bit ago. I wonder if that whole palaver has been resolved, he said to his fingernails, which were not the same fingernails he set off with. They had conveyor belted themselves a full cycle and more. The originals lay in pieces, suspended far and wide throughout the Caspian Sea, or resting in the sand to be churned up by crabs, one by one, slowly becoming dust. Although if I stay here dodging bills long enough, he might end up cutting my gas supply here. Whatever would this boat do without gas? I couldn't cook things. I couldn't... Well, I don't usually cook things anyway, but then I couldn't. Um, and maybe I might not be able to use the motor, depending on what he thinks gas is. Good thing we've got the sails, eh? Oof, it would be unthinkable. He slowly tapped the fingers of his right hand on the fingers of his left hand. First in order, then more randomly, then to a regular rhythm. Then, as if he was playing a tune on a mirror piano. He didn't really know how to play the piano. Axel F. You're so vain. He couldn't remember how that one went. He got up and looked out of the window, first trying a serious expression, like a suspicious glare at the imaginary troublemakers out there. Then he moved back and with a jump tried to surprise the view through the window to catch an imaginary spy in the act. It was getting a bit dark, but he could tell there was no one there. He sat back down, started tapping a bit differently, the nails of his left hand against the stationary flats of his right fingers. Barbie girl. Out here, all alone, it was much easier for him to privately admit to himself his own fondness for that one. That classical one with the violins. Fame, I'm gonna live forever. He thought how annoying it was that the most annoying tunes were the ones that kept coming back to annoy him at times like these. At least they weren't the gas man. Look, you shut up about that lousy gas man, French said, not raising his voice or feeling any emotion in it. He's my problem, my anxiety, not yours. Alfresco said from his chair, calmly and without fatigue. Besides, with your special author powers, you could probably make him turn up if you're not careful. And I wouldn't want that because it might cause some plot. Yes, exactly. You know, like a resolution to this story-long conflict. The whole premise. The whole, you know, reason for me being here and doing this. A neat narrative arc. And... He lowered and relaxed his fist, went back into the cabin, and sat back down, cooling his temper on purpose. And that would be a bad thing... to happen. He picked the recipe book and the new pen up from the edge of the deck where they had slid during this crazy monologue and returned to his all-important task. Outside, the edge of the big elliptical sun opened its mouth to kiss the horizon. The moon came out from behind a cloud to watch the creep. In the distance, two fishing boats greeted one another in a complicated cacophony of flags that, from the yacht, registered as a single flashing pixel between the sea and the sky. Frills the no frills was content for the moment as he made his way through a recipe for steamed carrot. Content and thoroughly unsatisfied. I could go back home, take the risk, couldn't I? After all, he's probably forgotten. The company's probably forgotten. It's probably fine. I could go back home and be normal, and it would be normal. He had a sip of the hot water he'd made to remind himself of tea, and I could be normal, and I'd pay my gas bills, and this would never have happened. Mm. Hot. But that would be a plot thing as well, wouldn't it? Not a nice safe resolution, nice and boring, but definitely plot. As he went to scratch his temple, the pen dropped out of his hand, bounced off a button on his shirt, and landed on the cat, who had an excellent time wrestling it onto the floor and pinning it triumphantly with her front paws. As the man eased the trophy back into his own possession, he continued, And didn't we make a sort of deal a while ago, so I would sit here mouldering and finding things for you to narrate until you got to... to some number of chapters, and then maybe I could... well, you'd leave me alone and I could... well, do something else. That sounds about right. I can't be bothered to check, but it's sensible as ever. Just as you'd expect from Mad Uncle Frink the Sailor. <laughs> Mad, eh? I'm not... you know, I'm the only one who's allowed to call me that. I may be crazy, I may, or whatever the correct psychiatrical word for what I've got is, but... but come on now, manners. He lowered and relaxed his fist and went back into the cabin and picked his book up off the floor and located the pen which was already just out of the door following its venerable sibling's path to enlightenment. 
goodness gracious, I'm telling the voices to mind their manners now. It's starting to sound just like old Aunt Maureen. Phyllis. She always used to say that the best way of settling your mind was to mop the floor. You hear that, author old chum old pal? I'd like a mop, please. That's awfully presumptuous, sane Uncle Frink the sailor. I'd ask you to mind your manners, for the sake of irony. Only you did say please. The cat was the first to spot it. Feeling rather put out after realising that her game, which she'd put so much care and attention into devising, would never actually get played at this rate, she was lying still, staring out at the dark water. Something began to bubble, right at the centre of her vision, right in the crosshairs. Something breathing out? A whale? Did they have whales in this part of the world, inaccessible from the sea? Maybe they'd always been there. Maybe they were cut off from the ocean when the coasts changed millions of years ago. Undersea ridges waking up and rising up. Drowsy giants baking in the sunlight, fossilising to become the Caucasus Mountains. When the ocean floors were cranked up on tectonic hydraulics. The sea skidding off in tsunamis of ripples. Mollusks and crustacea launched up and out and away in the spray. Their homes and haunts grassed over in green and colonised by horses and goats and buffaloes and antelopes and mammoths and leopards and tigers and humans and villages and farms and cities and borders and droughts and famines and tyrants and wars and power and bureaucracy and nationalisation and privatisation and companies and bills and the gas man. It was a plastic mop. It came up to the surface on its bubbles and played about on the dark gentle waves, swaying as if in a hammock of water. The cat stared at it, wondering if anything would happen if she willed it to approach. At this point, she had no particular desire to find out. Simple staring would be more than enough to be getting on with. The man stared at the cat, vacantly wondering what the cat was staring at. He had just filled in the O in cloves, and was also vacantly wondering if anyone actually liked cloves. He was also vacantly wondering which corner to start mopping from, and whether it would be okay to use seawater for the purpose. All in all, it was an extremely full vacant brain behind those staring eyes. Then he finally processed my narration from a couple of paragraphs ago and stared past the cat over the edge of the deck where safety and comfort instantly became the horror of the unknowable and the unchangeably changing, past that and to the sensible, homely mop, casual and free in its damp hammock. It showed no sign of anything but reliability, solidity. He was eager to grasp it, too slow and it must turn out to be another mirage. It was a race between him and reality, and Francesco won, and he took it, leaning out over the railing as far as he could, left arm pulled way back to barely get friction between the fingers and the railing, left leg up in a line with his right arm and reaching torso. Droplets of the unknowable deep wet his cheeks and soaked his sleeve, and he picked it up and didn't overbalance with the extra weight, and the mop flailed like a fish on deck, making slick the floor of its home for the first time. So... Vacant heart full and swelling with something or other, he welcomed it. That'll be my exercise for the day. He cracked his elbows, knees and neck, and sat back down in the cabin, casually reaching for the pen that was trying to escape again, the silly sausage, and filled in the E in cloves. There wasn't enough light anymore, and the gap he filled in was much bigger than the one there had been before. The whole letter now looked like it had once been a rather scribbly capital Q before its transformation into blobhood. A few words later, zest became zozb. He had also completely skipped over the word rolled in the meantime. Look, come on, you can stop that. I'm doing my best here under the circumstances. And, well, I don't know about you, but I'm sure any sensible outside observer would recognise my resilience and my committed work ethic. And it's about time you took a good, long, hard look at your... Wah! This was when he slipped on the mop, which was lying on the deck, in between the door and his preferred spot for fist shaking. Someone should tidy that up. As he bent down to move the mop, he got twanged in the face by a rope, which caused him to drop his pen and his book. The book happened to land in just the right place to block the pen from falling off the edge, which was handy. He managed to pick up all three items after some trial and error involving a tail, some claws, a bit of garbled muttering and a lot of trying to grab hold of the air, and successfully, after bumping his back on that rope from earlier and missing the door by four feet and ninety degrees, brought everything into the cabin, plonking it on the floor that turned out to be his bed, which was now covered in seawater from the mop. Just, just humiliation after humiliation after... Listen, come on, I'm just a person. You don't have to, you don't need to. You're allowed not to... Look, you can just not say some of these things. I do silly things. We all do. I mean, you also, I'm sure you do. You definitely do silly things as well. So, yes, look, you don't have to single me out like this just because you want to fill space in your silly book about silly old silly little me. It's okay. I'm fine. I'm normal. I'm... Yeah!
This was when he banged his forehead into one of those big metal joist things attached to the sails, charging into it with the conviction of a charlatan and the self-possession of an assassin. He was about 100 degrees off course for the yell at the sky spot he was aiming for, but that should go without saying at this point, what a plonker, what a silly, 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 silly little ingenue. Got no self-reflection, have you? Think about how I feel for once, the wind picked up. Just once. Don't you get it? He stood at the railing, left hand, white knuckle grip. Have you never got it? To have been an idiot and to keep being an idiot, but to try, to pretty well try! He raised his fist in defiance and triumph. The thunder exploded. You can't understand. There is no humanity in you, he whispered into the new rain. As it whispered freshness onto the deck, the sails, the roof of the cabin, the reddening bump on his forehead. Francesco quietly walked by lightning light into the cabin, positioned a small torch against the deck window, pulled the mop out into the rain, closed the door behind him, and worked by electric light. Steady. Quiet. Dignified. Chapter 13 the next morning felt like a genuine clean start to Francesco, who sauntered into the winter air the moment before sunrise. He greeted the stars on their way out, his close friends, his co-sufferers of authorial intent, stretching out his arms in a kind embrace, which also helped dispel the night's stiffness. The day was clean, like the boat, his home, a clean, bright canvas. Out here all seemed as it might always stay, a cosmos ordered and harmonious and regular. Such a moment invented Platonism, composed the first fugue, calculated the golden ratio, spoke yin to yang in all its still power. A passing seagull offloaded on the deck just next to him. But you know what? That was okay too. Frankie the Fallible could tolerate something like that on a day like today. He stretched again as he took the first glimpse of today's sun and spoke softly into the air. It's about time I dealt with that laundry, eh? There were several bags in the cabin. By this point in his adventures, all but one of them were stuffed with dirty clothes, seams beginning to split. They took up at least twice as much space as they had done when clean. And I don't know if that says something about Francesco's skillet producing sweat, but it is highly distressing in any case. Everything had been worn and reworn until deemed dirty and chucked aside, then worn again because it was the cleanest thing around several times. Being soaked with moppy seawater was far from the worst thing that had happened to the bedclothes, which had been lying in a pile in a leaky shed since time immemorial before being carelessly snatched on a last-minute, last-minute notion. It wasn't about time. That would have been, like, chapter one. I don't suppose you could, well, conjure up some sort of floating laundrette? He asked, opening cupboards and moving things around in case any of them were hiding a washing machine. Maybe one had been pacing anxiously around Baku Harbour, dead set on the salt air and the open sea, and had stowed away while Frollo the Quizzical was having his last frantic tea break in that cafe with the tapestries. It was, sadly, a lost hope. And he'd have appreciated the company. So he stood up, scratched his ear and sniffed, looked around at the corners of the ceiling for some reason, then found the cat and scratched the cat's ear for the sake of fairness. It would have to be the sink. He grimaced, though not exactly at the size of the task. The repetitive and the tiresome comforted him. The yacht's ingenious rainwater purification system had provided enough fresh water up to now, but he couldn't bear to imagine what he would do should it run out. To die of thirst, blokened cat, surrounded by clean, drying laundry, wasting its wetness that would pass straight into the cloudless air, helping no one, while bags and bags of the unreached stuff continued to steep and moulder. The idea of shoving a corner of a damp shirt or a cleaning rag into his mouth and sucking it dry, the clothesiness of it, minuscule suds lodging themselves in his taste buds, and afterwards having filled it with wrinkles and saliva. Or I could slosh it about in the sea. That might sort of work. He made to open the last bag on the right, and as he pressed down at the top, trying to untie what he now discovered was a hugely excessive, downright decadent knot in the nylon drawstring, compressing the bag's ripened, succulent innards, one valiant seam gave way. Everything slopped out on the nice clean floor. The flood set a certain pen a-rolling, and it rolled and rolled until Through Douglas enthusiastically snatched it from the brink of eternal washing. Francesco couldn't see all that clearly in the dim early light, but he recognised what the cat had done from the combination of sounds that had become so familiar yesterday. Nice catch, Jaya. All quite faint, the scuffling of the run of recognition, the growl of preparation, the little double click of claws against plastic against fibreglass. It made him nostalgic, which made him sad, which made him feel silly, which reminded him of his defiance against the author, which put him in a good mood. 
He stretched again as a reassuring breath of wind came from the left, chiming a melody in the strings of his ear. Zip McMip took an armful of sludgy, partially composted clothes and laid them out on the railing, one by one. This would be a good time to get rid of any that were too far gone. He considered the three ragged, stained somethings that now draped and dripped on the metal and thought he'd probably end up throwing everything overboard if those were anything to go by. He took a random something that looked a bit like a sock and tried chucking it in the sea as an experiment in sentimentality. No feeling. He hadn't recognised the thing before, and there was no sting of regret and recognition as it sank forever. Just the suspicion of lightness and freedom if he kept going. Maybe a handkerchief was consumed by the dark. Maybe half a pair of shorts was consumed by the dark, and the sun rose and the horizon grew pale. A pagan sacrifice to the darkness that liberates the light. He grabbed in his fists from the pile, which was then eaten, and he felt less heavy. He went back into the cabin, hefted the bag as best he could, with both the split seam and the top opening facing mostly upwards, started pulling stuff out in a jet of multicoloured drab grey that glistened and flew over the edge, and in symbiosis he felt flying, more and more, heart clean and atoned. The entire bag lifted itself up on dragonfly wings into the horizon and sank, and the ship was buoyed up in its heart. Francesco sat down and had a think. December was rolling along, almost ready to plunge into January and sink forever, and an unfeeling breath of wind pulled the colour from his hands and made them shiver. Gloves would come in handy. A pair of rubberized gloves bobbed, only just close enough to distinguish, but floating away, away into lostness. And he thought of what else might have floated out of view, would stay floating as the weather tore it apart and it became the plastics in a seagull's gullet. And suddenly the sea became a lake again, finite and fillable. He felt heavy, and his head was hung over and stuffed. So he organised the sails and headed for the receding double dot. He held the gloves, one in each hand, and shook them in the water. You could see the greyness drain off them and become nothing. When they dried they would still be stained and the salt had changed the rubber, but they would do. It would have been nice to see some of the other things I threw overboard, he thought. But all was bare and empty, and clear, and pristine as ever. Still, it was as though you could see the wounds, marked on the surface in imaginary red. There'll be time for grief later. Washing now. The next bag was actually stuck to the floor and the wall behind it. Something greenish had either seeped out, or been dropped on it, or grown there, and as he tugged, there was a sound like bones being ground. Unless the green stuff had been a living creature and was screaming its last breath, that was the paint being unwillingly ripped off the fiberglass wall crumb by crumb. The wall looked just as green and scabrous as the bag where it had been in contact. But no, he would have to think about that later. He would think about how to clean up that patch and whether it would be safe to breathe in those fumes, and if it would need repainting later. And if it would spread unless he found the right chemical. And if it had spread into the middle of the wall... He would have to think about that later, he thought, as he thought about it. And he was still thinking about all that, as he inched the fetid bag onto the deck, undid its zip, at least as far as the bit which the green sludge had conquered too. And he still worried about it, as both of his hands gripped the first item and scrubbed it against itself in the water. He scrubbed and hoped for the miracle of the mirage to re-emerge and bless the patch, with its miraculous power of undoing and rendering pointless. It would have been nice to believe that it was one of those things that only existed when observed. A quantum something or other, like a hiccough, except completely different. He'd been having a really good go at the... Uh, it was a pair of underpants, without paying any real attention to them. And when he stopped, he noticed that the fabric was getting pretty thin in various places. I haven't been scrubbing them that hard, he said, and paused scrubbing again, which he had managed to unconsciously resume at some point. Look, they're even still a bit greasy. It's all right, author. You can skip over this bit if you want. It'll be really repetitive, and I'm sure your readers would prefer not to hear about all the details and all the slimy bits and what have you. Although, I suppose anyone who's got this far has to be used to that sort of thing. They probably like it, even. You probably trick them into thinking it's all somehow entertaining or important, or... Am I allowed to... Would I be able to speak, you know, directly to your readers? Don't see why not, just never tried it before. So, yes, dear reader, the cat interrupted him with a pointed meow. He looked where she was looking, at the pants he had again continued washing, which were now, in fact, two separate pants, the cloth melting away like jam from a warm spoon where one half used to connect to the other. She pawed at the one in his right hand, and he let her have it. 
He watched her playing with it until she lost interest, and then watched the space where she had been playing. The moment without stimulus finally allowed him to feel. Being a very good-natured person, he cursed whoever it was who made the pants so fragile, whoever it was who allowed the first person to go through with such a demented plan, the sea for being so salty and bad and stupid, and himself for not dealing with the problem sooner, for not just using the sink and some soap, for who knows how many other reasons. No, no more of that. This was a clean day. He carefully laid the two individual pants to dry on the railing, picked up the mop from where it was casually leaning like it owned the place, dunked it in the water, and dealt with what the seagull had left earlier on. He felt okay. The tank was full from last night's shower. There was no need to worry about running out of fresh water. He could have said so earlier. No need to worry about running out of fresh water, provided he only washed some of the laundry today and left the rest for later. Oh, right, he said disappointed, and felt silly about finding such a minor thing disappointing, and feeling silly reminded him of his defiance of the author last night, but he didn't feel like defying the author anymore, after that helpful bit of information just now, so that made him feel silly too, but that was fine in the end. I suppose if I had tried to do it all at once there wouldn't be space to dry everything. He put the plug in the sink, and listened to the groaning of the tap, the white noise that instantly suffused the pipes, running their circuitous course up and around and up again, clean, clear water in surround sound. Some of it splashed on the counter with the rocking of the boat, harmonics and overtones in weaving polyrhythms, and there were vocals too. You there! said an intercom voice from somewhere generally outside, speaking as airy. Frelimpsest turned off the tap and went out. Right against his boat was another boat, mostly like his, but a bit bigger. He couldn't see the driver. There was the irregular, snoring bump of one hull against the other. Hey, you there! The voice repeated in Azeri from the speaker at the front of the cabin. Its windows were opaque at this angle. Yes, said Francesco in Azeri, putting more suspicion into his quiet voice than he'd intended. It's yours, said the speaker. When Friend looked at the other boat again, he saw on the deck a mess of nylon, canvas, algae and seawater, with a knotted drawstring and a great tear in the side. Yes, he slowly said. Please take it. Oh, yes. And he climbed up over the railing, onto the second, slightly higher railing, and stepped onto the new yacht. The floor here wasn't as clean as his, he noticed, with all the pride that warranted. Holding the sodden, mucky heap at arm's length, though, as you can now appreciate, it wouldn't have made much difference to his clothes if he'd held it closer, he heavily threw it onto his own deck. It made a growing, grey puddle. He stepped back over the railings. Have a nice day now, said the speaker in his airy. You too, said Francesco in English before he realised what he was doing. And the boat left. There were some things left in the bag, and when he fished them out, sure they were wet, but they didn't smell as bad as he'd been expecting. They weren't so saturated with gunk, and they seemed to be still the right shapes, still in the right number of pieces, and the bag itself looked almost intentional. He brought a couple of items and turned the tap back on, swilling the water around with a bar of soap. The sink filled up in chaotic twinned whirlpools. He thought of it as a lake in itself, and thought of the real lake with its floor and sides and bubbling springs, and saw a tiny fly light on the metal bank, and seemed to lie watching as the water rose up. He saw through the fly's many eyes a kaleidoscope view of the vast metal lake, swirling and leaping in slow motion, fed by a single terrifying torrent of solid rain, indomitable, fierce and mindless. And he turned off the tap, and watched the roaring mountains of the lake gradually settle down into placid hills, tenderly rocked by the world, the boat below them. The fly left. It was only the man, the cat, the boat, the rolling hills of the sea, the silent gaze of the sky, who remained. And you, the voice, of course. Can't forget about you. Well, I'm not there. I'm here at my computer writing my book, much as I've tried to. Frightening Zoroaster, my main man, scrubbed the first item between his hands in just the same way as he had done with the underpants in the sea. The fabric darkened in the water and clouded in the soap, and he could see it ever so clearly as stains and dullness simply lifted off and dissolved. It was the t-shirt that said, It's my life, like a boss, on the back. He'd forgotten about that one. He enjoyed that one. It flailed casually in the water as it was rinsed, and flagged happily in the cold breeze on the rope where it was hung. A pair of clean, unmatched socks soon joined it. A nondescript flannel stroke cleaning cloth joined them. By noon, the rope was full, a whole party of flags caroused there. Francesco came at last to the bag, broken and garlanded with algae. In itself, it was nothing to him, a cast-off that no one particularly wanted, but he thought he might be able to use, which was hidden in a corner for some while until the time came to set sail, when it was one of many thoughtlessly grabbed and stuffed and hoisted, but now it meant something. 
and he didn't know exactly what or why, but it had been seized back out of non-existence and was become more than itself. He hauled it over to the sink, still careful not to hold the foul thing too close to himself. He looked at the sink, then at the bag, then at the sink again, full of the scum and gunk of months without a shower. Out came the plug, and the water and the ooze were drawn down and away. Reader, please don't think too hard about where it's going. This is a very clever little boat full of complicated systems and functioning running water. I think it will manage. At least it should do, I think, as long as I think it's fine. Probably. The bag absolutely would not fit in the sink, however hard he tried. As he firmly but tentatively but extremely firmly manhandled the thing into position underneath the tap, he came to realise that when it sprang back and tried to regain its shape, it would engulf the tap and smother it. Water would spray everywhere. Nothing good would come of any of it. Standing well back, he turned on the tap to test his theory. Some got in his eyes. This time the sea would have to do. Out on the deck, Douglas the Cat had dislodged a light blue shirt, whose long sleeves had been hanging far down below the rope. She was busy exploring its sleeves when Francesco came out, his view blocked by the dripping, leaking lump cradled in front of him like a four-year-old, and slipped on the corner of the wet shirt. She ran off to a corner, the shirt clinging to her like an oversized hat part of the way. Francesco righted himself skillfully, though he couldn't avoid getting a face full of bag from the tip of his nose to where the chin meets the neck, and all down his front, and he bit in his tongue, and a drop of red suddenly appeared on the cloth directly under his nose. Nope, I'll be fine. That cat... No, I'll be all right. I'll have to get the seaweed off this shirt now as well. He tasted blood from two places at once. Mm, we've dealt with worse. He stumbled the rest of the way to the place where he'd first tried washing things over the edge. The cat hurried off between his legs to find a different corner, dropped the bag, rolled up his left sleeve, smeared his face on his bare forearm to clear some blood, swam the bag over the edge, back and forth, back and forth, horizontal like he was teaching it to swim. Slime dripped off like jam from a hot spoon. He felt dazed and fading somewhat, that slow, small blood diving over and over into the sea and losing its colour, over and over, and the sea didn't turn red, nor did it turn green from the algae or brown from the sludge, and then he picked the bag up by its base, drawstring dangling and dripping clear and free, a pendulum of infinite time. Shaking it, every droplet was clear and colourless, and he tied it by the drawstring as high up the main mast as it would go. Hands on hips, he looked at it eye level and face to face. Far from perfect, far better than it had been. Maybe he'd patch up the split when the opportunity arose. He washed his arm under the tap and held his nose until it stopped dripping and painting the metal red, then hurriedly heaped up cereal into a bowl and ate it outside, standing next to the mop against the wall and looking satisfaction at the drying laundry. So Douglas could play with Pericotte. the blue shirt for a while longer. Leaving the door open, the man sat down in the cabin and put a rough, matted blanket on his lap to keep the chill off. The cat sat on the mat, warm. Old Aunt Phyllis's recipe book continued to put on weight as it drank, drank up ink from the ballpoint bottle, completing it and transforming it. The sun was already low again, graffitiing its bedroom wall with all sorts of noxious, bright chemical splashes. It was later. It was time to check the stain in the cabin. Froldorol found the place where he thought it was and froze, confused. He picked up the other bags and the other bits of tat in the area, some of them meaningful, some just tat. He looked at the other side. No, that's where the bed was, and that's where the cupboards and kitchen things were, and that's where the door was, so it had to be... He took the whole lot of stuff, stuff that was his, stuff that was him, stuff that anyone else would have been ashamed of keeping and bemused about how and why they acquired it, stuff that stank and stuff that would disintegrate if you tried to clean it, and moved it all away to give him a good view of the wall and that toxic stain. It had been a mirage all along. The End <laughs>